Hello. Thanks for joining me for reading Paul's mail. We're continuing to unpack Philippians tonight, so let's get started. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So how were these people enemies of the cross of Christ? Well, Paul very clearly describes them by saying, here are people who have not recognized that when Christ died on the cross, they died with him. Their old earthly life, their old earthly existence, the things of this world that were associated with their life, that were associated with their identity, that were associated with the way they lived every day, those things died. That's why the Scripture says, the world is crucified to me and I to the world. When Christ died on the cross, remember, Everyone in Adam's race died with Jesus on the cross. Everybody died with him on the cross. So those who have been raised to life, just like Jesus was raised to life, those who are raised to spiritual life through faith in the Son of God, they're still dead to sin. They're still dead to the world. And now they've been raised in newness of life. And so they are not to continue walking and living in the ways that they were walking and living before they came to know the Lord. And that is what makes them enemies of the cross of Christ. Because remember, the cross is not an instrument of life. I want to say that again. The cross is not an instrument of life. The cross is an instrument of death. When we come to the cross, the cross represents the death of who we were. The cross represents the death of the likeness of Adam within us. The cross is an instrument of death, not an instrument of life. Well, then if the cross is an instrument of death, then what's the instrument of life? What makes us alive in Christ? Well, Just as Christ died and was buried, we're dead with Christ. And when Christ was raised from the dead on the third day after his crucifixion, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. When Christ was raised from the dead on the third day, we were raised with him. You see, just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. So when Jesus died on the cross, Adam's race died with him. All the members of Adam's race died with him. And when he rose from the dead, we rose with him, those of us who believe in him, those of us who have faith in him, those of us who trust in him, we were raised with him to newness, of life. So what was happening here? Let's look at the scripture again. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because they weren't realizing or identifying with the death of their own self, the death of their old self. They weren't identifying with that. They were just simply going on as if they were still alive in this world after they came to believe in the Lord. It says their end is destruction, their God is their belly. So whatever hunger they had, and and this is not just talking about physical hunger here. Yes, it's talking about the belly, so there is physical hunger involved here, but it's more than just physical hunger. It really represents all of the appetites and all of the desires and all of the hungers of our entire physical body, of our entire physical nature. That's why he says it like this. Pardon me just a second. Okay. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, 
and they glory in their shame. What is their shame? Their shame is all the things they used to do before they came to know Jesus. The shame is all the things they used to practice and all the way they used to live before they came to know the Lord. And instead of casting those things aside, instead of turning from those things, they're just continuing to indulge in them. They're just continuing to live in them as if they were still living in this present world and they were still living as if they belonged to this present world. And so their glory was in their shame, okay? Their minds are set on earthly things. And this is one of the most important things you can get out of the podcast tonight. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, we have to live in this world. Yes, we have to deal with things in this world. Yes, we have to do business in this world. But our heart should not be set, our minds should not be set on the things of this world. Our minds should be set on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has promised us and what he is bringing us when he returns from heaven to earth. He is bringing glory. He is bringing an inheritance. He is bringing deliverance from sin and death and hell. He's bringing all that with him, and he's going to bring deliverance from corruption, our bodies that die and and have to go to the grave. He's going to bring deliverance from all that, salvation from all of that. And that's where our mind should be. That's where our focus should be, where Christ is seated at heavenly places at the right hand of God. That's where our mind should be. But their mind is on earthly things. Then he goes on. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. That's what I was just saying a moment ago about our mind on what he's bringing us. That's what he's talking about here. He will transform our lowly body to become like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about our citizenship. He says our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Now I want to take a couple minutes here to discuss citizenship and to discuss what citizenship actually is. Um, This information is coming from Encyclopedia Britannica, and I'm a subscriber to Encyclopedia Britannica, so I'm using this tonight. Citizenship is a relationship between an individual and a state to which the individual owes allegiance and in turn is entitled to its protection. Citizenship implies the status of freedom with accompanying responsibilities. So I want you to notice here something about citizenship. Citizenship is not just privileges, okay? Citizenship is is not just a status of freedom with accompanying privileges. It's a status of freedom with accompanying responsibilities. So let's take a look at it some more here. Citizens have certain rights, duties, and responsibilities that are denied are only partially extended to aliens and other non-citizens residing in a country. In general, full political rights, including the right to vote and to hold public office, are predicated upon citizenship. The usual responsibilities of citizenship are allegiance, taxation, and military service. I'm going to read that again. The usual responsibilities of citizenship our allegiance, taxation, and military service. Now, I want to say just from the get-go that citizenship is a human term. Citizenship is a human idea. It came from human ideas. We'll look at it here in a minute. I, I'm not sure right now if I want to go that deep into it or not on the Britannica site. But basically, citizenship has existed and disappeared and resurfaced over the centuries. 
over the millennia. You see, what we have, we have two realms of existence. We have two realms we have to deal in. We live in the physical realm, this planet right here in our physical body and the land and the water and all of that. That's the physical realm. That's where we live. That's where we do business. That's where we carry out our lives here on this earth. But there is also spiritual realities that exist right alongside the physical realm. There's a spiritual realm that exists right alongside the physical realm at the same time. And we can't see it with these physical eyes. We can't hear it with these physical ears. We can't touch it with these physical hands. But it is real nonetheless. And there's a lot of people out there who claim to be atheists and claim to be agnostics. And I'm not here on this podcast tonight to argue with people like that or try to convince them of the reality of spiritual things. I'll just simply say this. Even in this physical, natural world, there are, four, there are far more things that we cannot see with our eyes, hear with our ears, taste with our tongue, smell with our nose, and touch with our hands than there are things that we can. And science has proven this. I think I shared this on another podcast when astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson put an article out several years ago about neutrinos, I believe it was, and how that there are all of these trillions of neutrinos going through every square centimeter of our skin all day long and all night long from the sun. And even though we can never see them, and even though we can never perceive them with our natural senses, nonetheless, they exist. And he says, even though that doesn't make sense, to our physical senses and our minds and our brains, doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense. Science has proven <laughs> that they exist, therefore they exist. Now, people who claim to be atheists, people who claim not to believe, will believe Neil deGrasse Tyson because science says so, but they refuse to believe the Word of God. Well, listen, it takes the same faith to believe in Neil deGrasse Tyson and neutrinos, the same faith as it does to believe in the Word of God. It really does. You have to have faith that somebody else did the research, somebody else did the tests, and somebody else came back with legitimate results, and they're not lying to you. That's what it is. That's what it amounts to. You have to have faith in the scientist. Not just in science. You don't just have to have faith in science. You have to have faith in the scientist. And so I believe Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. I believe there's neutrinos from the sun going through every square centimeter of my body, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But I also believe that there is a God in heaven. I also believe there is a spiritual realm. Now, I can't detect God or detect the spiritual realm with my natural senses any more than I can detect neutrinos, but I have faith in the person who told me about them, and I have faith in the people who have told me about God. I have faith in the scriptures that I've read about God, because none of those people have ever come here and tried to manipulate me or control me or force me to do anything or take any money from me or nothing else. They're just simply telling me the way to inherit eternal life, and I can either choose to believe it or choose not to, and so can you. And I don't have a problem with that. If you want to be lost, go ahead. I can't force you to believe. I can't force you to have faith, but I'm not going to stop having faith myself, and I'm not going to stop trying to help others have faith just because you choose to not believe. So go on your way. Have a good day. Bye. All right. So let's get back to citizenship. So citizenship is a relationship between an individual and the state to which the individual owes allegiance in turn is entitled to its protection, and the usual responsibilities of citizenship are allegiance, taxation, and military service. When Paul talked about citizenship, Roman citizenship was the model that both Paul and the Philippians understood. And so that's what Paul was talking about when he said, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body 
to be like his glorious body. Citizenship, it is not something that is just naturally given. And we'll see that here just in a second as we look at Roman citizenship. All right, so let's look at this. The concept of citizenship first arose in the towns and city-states of ancient Greece where it generally applied to property owners. So we're taking, we're going back here before Jesus. We're going back in B.C. times, okay? And in the Greek city-states, that meant that every, every little city was its own thing, just like we have states today inside of our country, the United States. Well, Greece, every city was its own little state. And, and we, we have the same thing today. We just call it a municipality, okay? And so they had their little city-state, and the only people that could be citizens in these ancient Greek city-states were people who owned property for the most part. And not only that, not only did they have to be citizens, but under those circumstances, it was only applicable to men. The only people that could be citizens back in those days were men. And women and slaves and poor members of the community were not granted citizenship. A citizen in a Greek city-state was entitled to vote, was liable to taxation and military service. The Romans first used citizenship as a device to distinguish residents from Rome who were in areas that territories that Rome had conquered and incorporated. So what had happened is this. The Roman soldiers, the Roman armies, legions, had gone out and had conquered different areas of the world. And what happened was is that people from Rome would travel to those places and Rome needed a way to tell, okay, well, who's from Rome and who's from wherever they've, they, wherever they've traveled to? What's the difference? Who's who? So the Romans first used citizenship as a device to distinguish the residents of the city of Rome from those whom, whose territories Rome had conquered and incorporated. As their empire continued to grow, the Romans granted citizenship to their allies throughout Italy and then to peoples in other Roman provinces until, until in 212 CE, which we would call it 212 AD, citizenship was extended to all free inhabitants of the Roman Empire. And so that is why Paul could say that he was born a citizen, because his father, not necessarily his mother, but his father was a citizen of Rome, and because his father was a citizen of Rome, then when Paul was born, he was born a citizen of Rome, okay? So this is a political thing. This is, this is a man-made political thing. But when he's talking about our relationship with God and when he's talking about where we belong and who we belong to as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. So let's talk a minute. So let's talk a minute about our heavenly citizenship. What are some of the characteristics of our heavenly citizenship? Well, first of all, our heavenly citizenship identifies us as belonging to Jesus while we are in this world. Just like when the Romans had the people from Rome go and travel to the different territories that they had conquered, Jesus has a kingdom. We are, we are members of Jesus' kingdom. Now, Jesus is ruling from heaven tonight. Jesus is on the throne of God tonight at the right hand of God the Father not only as our Savior, but also as our Lord. He is our King. He is God's prophet. He is God's priest. He is our intercessor. He is our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And we've covered a lot of that in other podcasts, so I won't go there tonight. But he's in heaven tonight. That's our homeland. Our homeland is not on this earth for many reasons. But number one, what did we say happened when Jesus died on the cross? When Jesus died on the cross, everybody in Adam's race died, okay? So 
what connection does a dead person have with the earth except being buried in it? None. They don't own property. Uh, my mother, I think I've told you this before, my mother had a living, uh, 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 oh, what's the name of it? It's a, it's a, a legal way that she was able to stay in her home as long as she was alive. My name and my sister's name were on the title of the property, but she, she had legal right to stay in that house until she passed away. But on the day that she passed away, she no longer owned that home. The moment that she breathed her last breath, I was the owner and my sister were the owners of that home. So she lost all claim to that property when she died. Okay, so what's that got to do with what we're talking about tonight? When Jesus died on the cross, everyone in Adam's race lost the rights to anything of this earth because we died with Christ on the cross. The entire race died with Christ on the cross. And the only one who was raised from the dead after that death on the cross has been Jesus. He's the only one. The Scripture describes him as the firstborn from among the dead. Not the only one, but the firstborn from among the dead, so that in all things he might have the supremacy. So literally speaking, the only person who has a legitimate claim to anything on this planet is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the resurrected Son of God. He owns the earth. His Father in heaven has given him all authority in heaven and on earth, and he owns the planet. He owns every continent. He owns every ocean. He owns every mountain, and he owns every valley. It all belongs to him. And we are waiting for him to return from heaven to, to earth to glorify us and transform us into his likeness fully and completely for eternity. That's what we're waiting for, friends. So where is our king tonight? Our king is in heaven, sitting on the right hand of God, sitting on a throne on the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet, and he will come again just as he left this earth when he ascended back into heaven. So our citizenship tonight is in heaven, and that identifies us as belonging to Jesus while we're in this world. We belong to Jesus. The only, why, the only way that we are alive is being alive in Christ. Christ is our life. There's another passage we read earlier where it said, for you died. That was referring to the crucifixion, our identification with Christ in the crucifixion. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we're still waiting to receive our inheritance. We're still waiting to receive everything that God has promised us that's our inheritance because of our faith in his Son. We're still waiting on that inheritance. It's being kept in heaven for us, and we're being shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Remember, part of being a citizen is the protection. So part of our citizenship is being identified as belonging to Jesus while we're in this world and, and having faith shielded by faith until the coming of the Son of Man. Oh, there's so much more in this tonight. I, the Lord put this on my heart tonight to start talking about this, and now I'm starting to get more and more stuff. And I don't have time to cover all of it tonight. But, you know, this, this is it. I was just going to really cover three aspects of it tonight, but I'm starting to see there's a whole lot more. This, this opens up a whole lot 
in the scriptures about our relationship with God and our relationship with Jesus and our inheritance and what is waiting for us in heaven when he returns. And wow, there's a whole lot in this tonight, friends. I hope you're getting blessed by this tonight. I am. <laughs> if you can't tell, <laughs> I'm getting blessed. So what about our heavenly citizen citizenship? Our heavenly citizenship identifies us as belonging to Jesus while we are in this world. So he knows his own. He knows his own. He knows who's his sheep, and he knows who's not. We don't have to do it ourselves. We don't have to worry about it ourselves. We have to be on, on our guard. We have to be alert so we don't get deceived, so we get led astray. But we don't have to worry about God not knowing what's going on. God knows exactly what's going on in the world. He knows what's going on with Hamas. He knows what's going on with Israel. He knows what's going on with the gays. He knows what's going on with the abortionists. He knows what's going on with the politics. He knows it all. Nothing's taken him by surprise, and he's still in control of the outcome. He's still in control of it all. Hallelujah to his name tonight. Okay, what else? Well, our heavenly citizenship reminds us that our allegiance is to Jesus. I want to say that again. Our heavenly citizenship reminds us that our allegiance is to Jesus. And remember what we what we read when we looked at when we read about citizenship that the usual responsibilities of citizenship are allegiance, taxation, and military service. Allegiance, taxation, and military service. Well, we don't have to serve right now in any military service, but we do need to have our allegiance to Jesus while we are in this world. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? All of Adam's race died with him. Well, how are they made alive? How do they come back to life? Well, they come to life through faith in Christ. And when you put your faith in Christ, then your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when he returns, you will come also. You will come alive. This last weekend, this is a little bit personal story. I hope you'll forgive me. But this last weekend was one year anniversary of my oldest son, David Andrew Johnson, going to be with the Lord. First eight months or nine months. I, I if I would drive through town, all of a sudden it would hit me. I'd see something familiar that me and Dave used to drive a lot. Dave was my buddy. That's the only way to say it. Dave was my buddy. From the time he was a little tyke, real small, he was my little buddy, and uh, he passed away. But he had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His two favorite books in the Bible were the book of Job and the book of Revelation. Those are his two favorite books in the Bible. He lived 43 years and two weeks. And uh, he trusted in Jesus. His faith was in Jesus. And we believe that he went into the presence of Jesus, November the 13th, 2022, at 1025 p.m. And we've been grieving for the year. This year we've been grieving. We still grieve. But we don't grieve like those who have no hope. Why? Because David has just simply gone ahead of us. You see, our life is not here. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. Our life is in heaven waiting to appear. When Jesus comes back from heaven to earth, we will come with him. David will come with him in a glorified body, different from the body that we buried, different from the body that's in the ground. That's not the body that comes. No zombie apocalypse, no rotting flesh and, and, and parts falling off and all, everything that Hollywood has invented. None of that, none of that is true, real. None of that is true. God will give us a glorified body that will not depend upon blood flowing through our veins. It will not depend upon air going in our lungs. It will be spiritually empowered with life. And it's going to be totally different than what we have right now. But one thing is for certain, he will change our lowly body, transform our lowly body, these bodies, 
to be like his glorious body. And when he does that, we will never die again. Never die again. That's the promise of God to those who believe that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we owe him our allegiance. Our life is hidden with him in God. And as citizens of heaven, we owe allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. There isn't anything in this world that we should serve other than him. There isn't anything in this world that we should desire more than him. That's why he said if anybody loves their father or their mother or their child or their spouse more than him, they're not worthy of him. That's what he said. Why? Because he is our king. He is our Lord. He is our God. He is our life. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. So as citizens, as citizens of heaven, our responsibility is allegiance, faithfulness, service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not all. Another function of our heavenly citizenship is that it informs us that we are stewards of the resources God places in our hands. I want to read that again. Our heavenly citizenship informs us that we are stewards. What is a steward? A steward is a servant who is given responsibility to care for someone else's property. I'll say that again. A steward is a servant who is given responsibility to care for someone else's property. Do you remember a minute ago when I told you that a dead person has no claim on anything on this earth, that you lose all claim to anything on this earth when you die, and that because every member of Adam's race died on the cross with Jesus, that none of us really have a claim of ownership of anything on this planet because Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He's the only one so far who's been resurrected from the grave, and he has the supremacy. He owns the earth. So because he owns it, because he's the only one that's been raised from the dead, he's the only one that lives again forevermore, because he rose from the dead, he owns the planet and everything he puts in our hand. 100% of everything he places in our hand is his property, not ours. We've not been resurrected yet. We died, and our lives are still hidden with Christ in God. So until we resurrect, until we rise from the dead the same way Jesus did, we have no property of our own. All we have is stewardship. All we have is responsibility for the resources that God places in our hands, and they are to be used in a way that honors God. Wow, that's really saying something. All right, so not only are we citizens of heaven, we are ambassadors for Christ while we are on earth. And I think we read this scripture last night. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So we are, we are dead in ourselves. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Christ, who is our life, must appear so that we can appear with him in glory. So what are we still here for? What's our purpose? Why does Jesus have us here now? Well, he has us here to be his ambassadors, to be the representatives of his kingdom on this earth. That's what it means to be an ambassador. Take a look at this real quick. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is the highest rank of diplomatic representatives sent by one national government for, to another. Okay? So we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the kingdom of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. So just as we are stewards 
of the resources that God places in our hands, we also are not to live for ourselves. Remember, he died for all that those that live should no longer live for themselves, but to live for him who died for them and was raised again. Remember that passage of Scripture we read, I believe, last night? So not only are we stewards, servants, who are responsible for the resources God places in our hands, we are also ambassadors from our homeland. And guess where our homeland is? It's in heaven. If our citizenship is in heaven, then our homeland is in heaven. And as citizens, we have been sent here by our commander, by our king, by our Lord, to represent him and to represent his interests in this world. And what is his interest in this world? His interest in this world is that we preach the good news of the forgiveness of sins and the availability of eternal life through faith in God's Son. That is the message that we're to give to the world. Because when Jesus died on the cross, all of Adam's race died. And we're still waiting for our lives to appear when Jesus appears. So what's the condition of everybody else right now? They're dead. And the only way they can come alive is to be in Christ. That's the only way for anyone to inherit eternal life in the kingdom of God is to come through the door, to come through Jesus, to come through the way, the truth, and the life. And we are his ambassadors. We are his representatives holding out the message of deliverance, holding out the message of reconciliation with God through faith in what Jesus Christ has done. That's why we're here, friends. So what should we be doing in this world as ambassadors for Christ? Well, let's take a look. We have an example from the Old Testament. When God sent Judah into exile in Babylon, God instructed the Israelites to live life and work for the welfare of their city. And I have to tell you something here tonight. I have really struggled this over this through the years. And I, <clears throat> I have to admit, I've not been one who has been much for what people might call activism. I've never been an activist, so to speak, okay? I've not been totally withdrawn from public life or from the politics. I mean, I vote, <laughs> you know. I don't campaign for people and that sort of thing, but I do try to do my civic responsibility and vote. But I've also been conscious of what I've been telling you up here until now about how our citizenship is in heaven, not on this earth, not, not in this world. But then I saw this scripture, and this is uh, from Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And when God sent Judah into exile in Babylon, God instructed the Israelites to live life and work for the welfare of their city where God sent them into exile. And here's the scripture. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Okay, here's something I want to show you tonight. I think one of the reasons that a lot of us as Christians have been so hesitant to get involved in worldly affairs and worldly politics is become is out of a genuine heart. It's out of a heart that desires to put first things first, to put the most important things first, which are the things of God and the things of heaven and the, and the, and the things of Jesus. And that is a very, very, very virtuous and good thing to do. And I no way uh, uh, denigrate that or or 
belittle that in any way. That that should be our ultimate goal. Because didn't we just say that that we're to live in this life and this world for His glory and for His purpose? So yes. However, what we have to realize is that we are living two thousand years after the scriptures were written, and during this period of time that we have been living and and before we lived, God has been at work. I mean, God has been at work in the earth. God has been at work growing his kingdom and populating his kingdom in the earth. And there are things that people in previous generations didn't have the privilege of doing that we have today. For example, when we read this description of citizenship and we talked about how the Romans first used citizenship as a device to distinguish the residents of the city of Rome for the people whose territories Rome had conquered. And then we read about the concept of citizenship and how it first just applied to property owners, but not to women or slaves or poor members of the community. Well, see, things have changed. It's not that way today. Today, you're a citizen simply by being born here. And if you're a citizen, then you can vote. Once you get to the age where you can register, I think it's 18 now, you can vote. All right? So what does that mean for us as Christians? It means we should vote. Why? Because of what God told the Israelites when they went into exile in Babylon. What did he tell them to do? He told them to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I want to read that again. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And I want to tell you something tonight. In the natural, I could see where an Israelite, a descendant of the tribe of Judah, would resent that writing. In fact, I think that if you read further in in the book of Jeremiah, you'll see how they they didn't want to hear that. <laughs> they, you know, God had already told them, "You're going into exile for seventy years. That is just done because of the idolatry and because of." not being faithful to God and, and not following the law and all that. So it's a done deal. It's, it's going to happen. No way to avoid it. And I could see how somebody being carried off into exile to Babylon would kind of be resentful. I think about Daniel. He's, he's the one that always comes into my mind, Daniel being carried off into exile at the age of 15 or so. And he goes to Babylon. And not only does he go to Babylon, he gets trained in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar, the king who conquered his land, the king, who carried him off into exile, and he's trained and educated to serve that king. I mean, that that would be like one of us here in America being kidnapped or, or, or being exiled or carried off by China or carried off by Russia or carried off by Iran or carried off by some other country and being forced to serve in that government, being forced to work for the welfare of that government that kidnapped us and took us away. Can you imagine that? I don't think a lot of us would be willing to do it. In this, in this day and age, in this land, we would, we would consider that treason. We would consider that really bad, be not be willing to do it. But that's exactly what God told Daniel to do. That's exactly what God told the Israelites to do, the descendants of Judah to do, when God sent them into exile in Babylon. He said, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And you might say tonight, but Pastor Randy, we're, we're not in exile. We're not in exile from heaven. Well, yeah, that's true in a sense. But the Apostle Peter gave believers similar instructions to live in this world as though we were in exile from heaven. I want to say that again. The Apostle Peter gave believers 
similar instructions to live in this world as though we were in exile from heaven. You'll say, well, where's that at? Well, it's in Peter's mail. Peter's mail, this is a general letter that, that Peter wrote to all of the churches that he was associated with. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So see, even Peter was telling the people then to, to look forward to the return of Jesus because that's what's going to bring your inheritance to you. That's what's going to bring the fulfillment to you. That's what's going to bring your life to you is the return of Jesus. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So right there, that tells you what is expected of us as ambassadors of the kingdom of Jesus in this world. We're expected to be holy. I'm going to say it again. We are expected to be holy right here and right now. Do you remember last night what grace is doing? What grace is training us to, for? Not just to have our sins forgiven and take us to heaven when we die. No, 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 no. Grace is training us to live godly, upright lives in this present age while we wait for the return of Jesus. And that's what Peter is saying right here. Be holy because he who called you is holy. You shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear. Now, he's talking to saved people. He's talking to people who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to people who have had their sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. He's talking to people who are looking for Jesus appearing. And he's telling them, live your life here. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Isn't that interesting? Why does he use that word? Well, because the Israelite people were very used to knowing about the word exile. They, they understood exile. And now he's writing to the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's comparing our life right now, right here, down on the earth, with the exile that the Israelites experienced when they went to Babylon. He's, he, it's like a comparison, an analogy between the two, so that we're away from the Lord right now. Remember we read earlier, to be, to be away from the Lord is, is what we are now in these bodies, and to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. So right now on this earth, on this planet, in this life, we are away from the Lord. So it's almost as if we're in exile from heaven. We're in exile from our homeland. That's what Peter's talking about here. Knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So what does that mean? That means that even though we live in this world, we do not belong to it. We have been bought out of it. We have been redeemed, bought back to God. And yes, he has us here, but he has us here for his purpose, for his glory. But our citizenship, our homeland is in heaven, and we're waiting for our king. We're waiting on our Lord. We're waiting on our Savior to come and bring us our inheritance, beginning with our own resurrection and our own translation of our mortal physical bodies so that they are like his glorious immortal body. That's what we're waiting for. That's where our hope is. Not to escape, to be fulfilled for everything that God has promised us to come to fulfillment. And he's left us here to try to persuade men to be reconciled to God. 
Jesus has already done it. He's already done everything that's necessary for you to be reconciled to God. He's already done everything that is needed for you to become a son of God. He's already done everything that's needed for you to become a daughter of God. He's done it. It's finished. There's nothing more that needs to be done. All you have to do is receive it by faith. And when you receive it, your life will be hidden with Christ in God, and you'll begin to wait for him to bring your life to you and conduct yourself as an alien and a stranger in this world, being holy because he is holy and being an ambassador for him and a steward of the resources he places in your hands. Hallelujah. You're ransomed from feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in this last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So here's what we have. We have citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. But we're in exile right now. We're not in heaven right now. We're here on earth as ambassadors for our king, as ambassadors for our Lord. And since we're here on earth, we have an assignment. So we have citizenship in heaven and an assignment on earth. And that's what it's all about, fulfilling our assignment on earth earth. That is why you're here. That's what life is all about. That's the purpose of life. The purpose of life is to serve Jesus Christ, to fulfill the purpose of God in this life and in this world. Hallelujah. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always here. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And you want to know something, my friend? He can live in your heart as well. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God bless you tonight.